I'll get a hot chocolate. I actually have
Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming. It's lovely to see familiar faces and people I haven't um, seen before. Uh, this is our first event of the week of uh, uh, the Christian Union. So my name is Ethan, if I haven't uh, met you already. And um, the theme of our event this week is, am I enough? So we have plenty of different topics on lots of different things um, that we, uh, we think NSC students are passionate about, uh, including, I can't remember them off the top of my head, so <laughs> um, achievement, balance, self, uncertainty, and today's topic, which will be about justice. Um, so with us today, we have Max baker Hush and um, Eleanor Smith, who are going to come and uh, talk to us about uh, justice and a Christian perspective on it. And um, we're going to do, like, I'm going to give them the opportunity to come and um, to talk about it. And then also um, a Q&A um, halfway through where we can um, ask them lots of different questions. And also we're going to have a time of feedback at the end where you can, if you like the host or if you don't like the host, or um, <laughs> any any feedback would be really appreciated. And um, yeah, it's um, a lovely a lovely occasion. So yeah, take away. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. Um, so yeah, um, it's really good to be with you uh, this evening. So my name is Max Baker Heitch. I'm a lecturer in philosophy at Wycliffe Hall, Oxford University, and uh, I've uh, I've been in Oxford uh, for the last kind of twelve years. So I I came there to do. Um, <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I uh, I did my doctorate in philosophy um, in Oxford as well, and also spent some time in America. Um, but yeah, I guess I um, I'm I'm passionate about sort of uh, the the big questions in life, which is why I guess I was propelled towards doing philosophy. Or you could say, in a way, I stumbled across it. So my my mum said, "Oh, you might enjoy studying philosophy at university." I didn't do that for my A levels, right? So I I did go and study philosophy. I was not very interested in the subject at all at first. Actually, I wasn't really attending classes. But anyway, it's a long story. But I end I actually ended up becoming a Christian in my first year at Exeter University, um, and quite quickly became extremely passionate about philosophy because of the way that it it sort of um, it kind of opened up a whole universe to me of, of trying to grapple with these big questions and, and to think about how, how can we give a systematic account of reality. Um, and uh, yeah, so 
I, I'm going to be speaking to you this evening on the question of, um, of justice and, and how Christianity might have something to say to this topic. Um, so I think it's become almost a cliche to say that we live in a, a very polarized world. There's all sorts of um, survey data that, that would seem to indicate that political polarization has become a lot worse in the last few years. Um, and, you know, I, I find that after any uh, significant politically controversial event that's in the news cycle, I, it's sort of with trepidation that I open my social media feeds, um, especially because I have friends on different sides of um, the political spectrum. And just, uh, it, yeah, it's just not very pleasant seeing people um, at each other's virtual throats um, over these kinds of issues. And the thing is, as well, it's not just online acquaintances who descend into ferocious battles of words with each other. Um, bitter disagreements over politically sensitive topics are increasingly a cause of division among families and couples. So uh, in 2019, the marriage guidance charity Relate uh, said that couples who sought help from them were increasingly pointing to tension over political issues such as Brexit as a major cause of uh, domestic strife. So the, the, the weird thing is, in so many ways, the world is more joined up, it's more interconnected than ever before. Uh, you, you've probably heard the old idea that each of us is connected in principle to any other person on the globe by no more than six degrees of separation. I heard this idea of six, six degrees of separation. Okay, so the idea is that every person in the world is linked to any more any other person on the planet by no more than six links in the chain, um, where each link consists of two people who have sort of some kind of personal connection to each other. And Facebook, um, who after all have the data to be able to test this, have actually put this hypothesis to the test. And what they found is that actually the average number of links in the chain between any two people in the world is getting less and less each year, and maybe that's not surprising. So the average number of links between any two people in the world now is just over three and a half. So in a very real sense, the distance between us all is shrinking. But why then does it feel as though the world is getting more and more disagreeable and fractious and more disunited in many ways? And no doubt part of the answer is to be found by analyzing uh, socioeconomic trends, looking at the way in which socio-political changes have coincided with the rise of new technologies like social media, and now, of course, things like chat GPT and how's that going to change things. And all of that would certainly be relevant and interesting. But I think another part of the answer has to be to consider my own contribution to all of this. Um, so I would have to say my own contribution is anything but blameless. So too often I've uh, fallen for kind of clickbaity articles that I know are designed to simultaneously enrage me and boost feelings of self-righteousness. Uh, too often I've been inclined to write off someone uh, as a friend because they express some opinion on social media that I think is stupid or uh, even wicked. Um, and too often I've allowed myself to slip into an easy kind of us and them mentality. So us being people who are upstanding, reasonable and virtuous, and them being people who are wicked, misguided and dangerous. And so, I, you know, I sometimes wonder, well, I, if only it would come more instinctively to me to kind of pause and take a deep breath and extend a bit more charity. So is the, is the answer to the problems of our world that we all just need to kind of calm down a bit, um, that we're all just kind of as much to blame for the problem of polarization and tension as each other? Um, is it sort of a case of half a dozen of what, six of one and half a dozen of the other? Um, is it just that both sides of every conflict have their blind spots and just as ever, both sides of every conflict have their glimpses of the truth? Well, that, might, that sort of analysis might um, be applicable to some conflicts and some disagreements, but I don't think that that's going to be very satisfactory when we look at some of the, the really serious cases of injustice in the world. So yes, some conflicts are like this, but not all. Uh, there are some situations in the world in which there is a genuine asymmetry 
situations in which a, a genuine injustice is being perpetrated by one set of people uh, against another, and in what in which one side is more to blame than the other, and in which the narratives being told by the two sides are not equally valid. Now, in the early 2000s, a number of um, you know, social commentators, and, uh, philosophers indeed, were suggesting that relativism, so the idea that no one's narrative is more valid than anyone else's, was kind of becoming the deeper <laughs> in the West. But my sense is that at this point in time, more and more people are coming around to the view that not all narratives are equally valid. Um, just to take one example, uh, the narrative that says that uh, that women could be treated as playthings by powerful men is not just as valid as the narrative that says that women deserve to be treated with respect and dignity. And interestingly, you know, when Harvey Weinstein's uh, long history of mistreating women finally came to light, he tried to claim that, uh, well, all that happened in a bygone era when moral standards concerning the way men uh, treated women were different, uh, so it was okay. Well, quite rightly, I think most people rejected that relativistic tactic by Weinstein. Um, and indeed, it's only by acknowledging that some narratives are a more accurate reflection of reality than others that we're able to recognize genuine injustice in the world. What's more, it's only by recognizing that some people are actually in a better position to notice certain forms of injustice that we're able to acknowledge the full extent of unfairness that exists in the world. And after the George Floyd uh, killing in the summer of 2020, I just asked a, a friend of mine um, who's black um, if she would just kind of talk me through sort of what it's like to be in her skin. And um, she um, did her degree at Oxford and um, you know, is extremely uh, brilliant and, and um, capable. But she told me of all the, the times that she's you know, turned up to job interviews and that they've assumed that she's just the cleaner or that she's been stopped and searched in airports and all of these things that um, never really would have even occur to me that, that that would be something I would have to consider. Um, and so the, the, there are some people who are um, more able to notice certain forms of injustice than others. So of course I have experienced some injustice at an individual level. You know, I've experienced school bullying as many people have. And that's kind of in, um, treatment that's been directed at me as an individual, but there are some forms of injustice that I've never experienced firsthand. So I have never in my life been stopped and searched. Um, I've never been denied service at a shop or restaurant because of the way I look. Um, I've never had to put up with wolf whistling in the street. I've never been insulted due to my skin color, maybe due to my hair color, but um, that's, I think that's, uh, I, and, you know, in a way, the reason I can joke about that is because it's it's not actually a serious form of discrimination in the world. Um, but treatment in virtue of someone's skin color, now that's a different matter, and that's something I've never experienced. I've never been told that a certain type of job isn't for people like me, and so on. And so I want to acknowledge that we live in a world in which there are still forms of injustice that afflict some people in virtue of their belonging to a certain group. I think these are some of the hardest kinds of injustice to deal with. Arguably, it's these sorts of injustices and the question of how they should be addressed. That is the source of the, a, a great deal of the tension we experience today. Believe it or not, uh, the Bible has a lot to say about all this. But, you know, of course, bringing up the Bible and Christianity has probably immediately got you wondering how helpful is it to bring up a book and the a religion that have made no small contribution to perpetrating the sorts of injustice that I've just been alluding to? Isn't it true that Christians have perpetrated all manner of uh, atrocities down through the ages, including, but not limited to, military crusades that slaughtered thousands of innocents, um, you know, inquisitions in which suspected heretics were subject to torture, uh, engaging in literal witch hunts, um, helping to set up and defend systems of legally enforced racial segregation in places like South Africa and the uh, American Deep South, and many more things besides. 
And I want to say, yes, it's undeniably true that people who sincerely thought of themselves as Christians participated in all of these things and more. Um, and I think that it, it's absolutely essential to acknowledge that before going on to try and say something about what the Bible might have to offer on the question of injustice. And the sad irony about this is that, as the Yale uh, theologian Miroslav Volf puts it, the whole of the Judeo-Christian scriptures are biased towards the powerless. And the Bible not only shows a bias towards the powerless, but it's consistently written from the perspective of the powerless. It can be hard for us to appreciate this fact today, given that Christianity in the West is understandably often associated with establishment and privilege and so on. But the Jewish people who wrote what we call the, the Old Testament um, and the earliest Christians, almost all of whom were Jews, who wrote what we call the New Testament, were actually anything but privileged in the world they found themselves in. So the nation of Israel um, in the Old Testament is actually almost a definition of an underdog. So biblical Israel was um, really a quite small landmass, not very much bigger than modern day Wales. But as the New Testament historian M.T. Wright has noted, um, Israel was uh, subject to invasions by hostile powers, often much bigger empires, um, almost once every 40 years on average. And throughout the story of the Old Testament, Israel repeatedly finds itself uh, faced with the threat of being annihilated uh, by those much larger, mightier empires on its doorstep. So this starts with the Egyptians, who enslaved the Israelites for thousands or for, for over 400 years, subjecting them to harsh labor and so on. And it continues with the Assyrian Empire, which totally wipes out a big portion of uh, Israel and almost entirely wipes it out. And it gets even worse with the Babylonian Empire, which uh, lays siege to Jerusalem and takes the, the, the Jewish people into a forced um, captivity in Babylon where they remain for two generations. And the Book of Lamentations in the Old Testament um, is a, a collection of poems of mourning written uh, when the Jews were um, conquered and deported to Babylon. Mm -hmm. and, and this is just a line from the Book of Lamentations. So after, after affliction and harsh labor, Judah has gone into exile. She dwells among the nations. She finds no resting place. All who pursue her have overtaken her in the midst of her distress. Her foes have become her masters, her enemies are at ease. So there's a kind of respite from all of this when the Persian Empire takes over from the Babylonians and um, the Persian king Cyrus allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem and rebuild their temple. But then things kind of went back to the usual way when the uh, Greek king Alexander the Great um, sort of swept across the known world and once again subjected the, the Israelites to oppression. And eventually the Greek Empire gives way to the Roman Empire and once again Jerusalem comes under a military siege. By the time Jesus is born, which is about 5 BC by the reckoning of most historians, it's no exaggeration to say that the Jewish people, the people who in which Jesus was born, were among the most oppressed and downtrodden people on earth. And so it's not too hard, hard to understand why um, many of the Jewish people around the time of Jesus were holding out the hope for uh, God to give them a king who would rescue them from their enemies and oppressors and restore their, their national pride. So that is, many of the uh, Jews around the time of Jesus were hoping for a Messiah, which means an anointed one. Many of them were hoping for a, a specific kind of Messiah, uh, a military king basically, a, a messiah who would lead a military uprising against the Romans and ultimately drive them out of the land. And so it's no wonder that Jesus didn't exactly fit neatly into those hopes and expectations. Um, so not only did he not lift the sword against the Romans, but he exhorted people to love their enemies, to pray for people, for, for those who persecuted them, and to extend radical forgiveness to those who had done them wrong. And so hopefully we can glimpse something of how striking and provocative this would have been, given the context I've just sketched. So when Jesus talked about loving one's enemies, uh, his audience would have known that this included the hated Roman overlords. 
So what possible sense can it make to love our enemies? Um, why would Jesus have suggested such a thing? So a friend of mine uh, recently told me that while he admires a great deal about Jesus's ethical teaching, he thinks that Jesus just got it wrong when he exhorted us to love our enemies. And my friend thought, thinks that to love our enemies is neither possible nor desirable. But I want to suggest that Jesus actually did know what he was talking about. When he said that we should love rather than hate our enemies, he said it knowing that when we allow resentment and hatred towards another person or group of people to take hold deep within us, it's actually we ourselves who suffer the most. And Nelson Mandela kind of brought out this point, no doubt very influenced by Jesus' teaching. When he said that resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. I don't know if you've ever harbored deep bitterness towards someone. I think probably most of us have had that experience at some point. And it's not very pleasant. Um, and what's more, if and when we do ever get the chance to exact revenge on the people who've hurt us, the satisfaction doesn't last very long. It's ultimately quite hollow. Um, there was a film few years ago called The Revenant um, with Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, and um, in it, Leonardo DiCaprio plays uh, Hugh Glass, who's a, basically a frontiersman in the American West in, I think, the mid 19th century. And uh, he basically, um, DiCaprio's character, Hugh Glass, gets mauled by a bear. Um, and, at one, and so his friends, um, colleagues, have to kind of carry him around on a stretcher. And at one point, while he's lying on this stretcher, completely incapacitated, he's forced to watch as his son, who is half Native American, is murdered in front of him by one of his fellow frontiersmen, a, a racist, spite-filled man named John Fitzgerald. And basically, the rest of the film is about the way um, that uh, DiCaprio's character, Hugh Glass, sort of goes on this long and winding pursuit of Fitzgerald through these extremely beautiful frozen mountain landscapes. Um, and he eventually catches up with his enemy and exacts revenge. And as the dead body of John Fitzgerald is floating away down the river, there's just this real sense of emptiness and futility about it. The sort of revenge didn't turn out to be so sweet after all. So does this mean that we shouldn't be angry about injustice? Does it just, should we just be kind of passive in the face of witnessing heinous wrongdoing? Well, I think not at all. Um, it may surprise you to know that there are several um, episodes in the gospels, biographies of Jesus' life, where Jesus is described as being deeply angry, um, indignant actually, at the callousness of human beings towards the misery of other human beings. But I think what all of this does mean is that if we take upon ourselves the sort of heavy burden of standing in the place of ultimate judgment over the people who've wronged us or who've wronged others, um, it will crush us in the end. Um, the Yale theologian Miroslav Volf, who I quoted earlier, um, lived through the uh, wars in the Balkans that racked the countries of what was the, the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s. And he has some really interesting observations on uh, the nature of forgiveness and justice. So Wolf knew a lot of young men who'd seen their families murdered before their very eyes. Um, and Wolf remarks that if it weren't for his belief in a God who will eventually judge every human being, um, he would have been able, unable to say anything to uh, dissuade those young men from taking justice into their own hands and exacting revenge. Um, and Wolf writes that, um, he says, my thesis is that the practice of non-violence requires a belief in divine judgment. It takes the quiet of a suburb for the birth of the thesis that human non-violence is a result of a God who refuses to judge. In a scorched land soaked in the blood of the innocent, that, in, that idea will invariably die, like other pleasant captivities of the liberal mind. If God were not angry at injustice and deception and did not make a fine line of violence, that God would not be worthy of our worship. So that brings me to a final question, and one that's perhaps even more troubling than the questions I've tried to say something about up to this point. 
how could God, if there is a God, be in any position whatsoever to stand in judgment over human beings? Um, given the litany of horrors that uh, God has allowed human beings to, to be subjected to. But if God has uh, upheld and sustained this world that involves uh, you know, industrial scale atrocities like the transatlantic slave trade, the Nazi death camps, Soviet gulags, how could God be well placed to look into our hearts? Um, if anything, shouldn't it be God's standing trial before us? Well, the theme of God being put on trial is actually one that has been explored in a number of novels uh, and plays down the centuries. And one particularly striking such play um, is called The Long Silence. And it's really a very brief kind of vignette that depicts a scene at the end of time when the whole of humanity is gathered on a vast kind of plane before the throne of God. And gradually people start to come forward who have um, suffered unimaginable injustices of various kinds in order to present their charges against God's goodness. So just quoting a bit from that. So, so each of these groups sent forth their leader, chosen because he had suffered most, a Jew, an African-American, a person from Hiroshima, a horribly deformed arthritic, a thalidomide child. In the center of the plane, they consulted with each other. At last, they were ready to present their case. It was rather clever. Before God could be qualified to be their judge, he must endure what they had endured. Their decision was that God should be sentenced to live on earth as a man. Let him be born a Jew. Let the legitimacy of his birth be doubted. Give him a work so difficult that even his family will think him out of his mind when he tries to do it. Let him be betrayed by his closest friends. Let him face false charges, be tried by a prejudiced jury and convicted by a cowardly judge. Let him be tortured. At the last, let him see what it means to be terribly alone. Then let him die. Let him die so that there can be no doubt that he died. And let there be a great host of witnesses to verify it. As each leader announced his portion of the sentence, loud murmurs of approval went up from the throng of people assembled. And when the last had finished pronouncing sentence, there was a long silence. No one uttered another word, no one moved. For suddenly all knew that God had already served his sentence. God has come in the flesh. That's the claim at the heart of Christianity. Uh, God became like us, knew firsthand what it's like to be a human being, and not a kind of comfortable, well-off human being, but a human being who is intimately acquainted with hardship and trouble, um, and who was subjected to a sham trial, um, his friends having fled in terror and abandoned him, and he was subjected to the horrors of Roman crucifixion, which is widely thought to be one of the worst methods of execution that's ever been devised. Now, I haven't always been a Christian. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I started Christ uh, to consider Christianity seriously when I was an undergraduate student in philosophy. And there was a, a point when I was thinking deeply about various concepts of God and what God might be like. And there was a nagging thought that I had that went something like this. I don't know if there is a God, um, but if there is, it would have to be a God who really knows what life is like down here in this sort of mess and confusion. And only if that kind of God existed could it make sense to love our enemies, uh, because he loved his enemies. Only with that kind of God does it make sense to let go of our bitterness and resentment towards the people who've hurt us. And I don't mean letting go in a way that means we sit passively back in, in the face of injustice, but in a way that lets go of that really heavy burden of kind of standing in the place of ultimate judgment over people who've hurt us um, and gives that burden to a God who knows firsthand what it's like to be on the receiving end of justice. Thanks very much and uh, yeah looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you Jeff. Um, hello. Yes. Hello. Um, I'm Eleanor, um, and um, I work at a large uh, NGO, um, a justice-seeking organisation, um, which is actually a large anti-slavery organisation, and uh, we work globally to protect people living in poverty 
from violence. And I wanted to come and share today um, to explain to you why as a Christian, I think that um, what I do is fundamentally important and a fundamental part of my Christian faith. Um, I want to say thanks to Max for um, being a great, uh, what she's following, hey? Um, <laughs> and particularly struck by your reflections on God coming in the flesh and thus being one who understands the reality of injustice. And that's something which I, um, in my work as I confront injustice regularly, often find myself clinging to, um, is that there's a God who, um, I believe in a God who, who knows intimately the reality of injustice. Um, I'm not going to share for that long, hopefully, who knows, um, to leave plenty of time for Q&A, but I wanted to share with you actually a little bit of my story and the reasons why I think that the Christian faith offers the best answer to the injustices faced in the world today. Um, there's plenty I could share about and feel free to ask me to elaborate or clarify on anything in the Q&A, but let me begin by telling you about one of my personal experiences of seeing justice done and how it's impacted me. So about three and a half years ago, um, I accompanied one of my best friends to court. And she was there to give a victim impact statement at a sentencing hearing for historic childhood sexual abuse. We were lucky in the fact that that even got to court. I'm aware that many of these cases do not find their way into the justice system for various reasons. But we were there, um, the um, accused had pled guilty um, after a little bit of back and forward, and um, she was there to give a victim impact statement. And I don't know if you have ever spent any time in a courtroom. Um, it's really, it's it's really hard, um, particularly on a topic um, of, like this one. Um, what happens is um, basically the lawyers will read out the charges very bluntly. So to say this is what is alleged to have happened, this is what this person's pleaded guilty to. And if it's a case as it was of sexual abuse that is particularly blunt and particularly graphic, I don't need to go into details about it. And it's and then what happens is they do a little bit of kind of um, reflection on that, um, they plead, and then you get the case where possible for there to be a victim impact statement. And what that offers is the opportunity for the survivor, the victim, to share about how it has impacted their life personally. And um, my friend chose to do it behind a curtain so that she didn't have to face the person who had inflicted this on her. And what it basically shows is the brutal reality of the impact of evil. Let's call it what it is. The brutal reality of the impact of injustice on just one person. My friend is just one person. She lives with complex PTSD, ongoing issues, um, physical, emotional, mental. Um, and to sit and to hear her having journeyed with her for about 15 years at that point um, and seen the impact of her, hear her read it out. I sat down, it, was, it took everything within me not to just sob. But in that courtroom, we were lucky enough, as sad as that situation was, we were lucky that we saw the judge bring justice. And what we actually saw the judge do was hold justice and mercy very well. And I'm aware this is not often the case. It's not always the case um, with these kind of issues. But um, what happens in, uh, in a sentencing hearing um, is that they begin by categorizing the crime uh, based on its severity. So the gravity of what had been done and recognizing its impact. And they state what that sentence is gonna be. They have guidelines in front of them. So this person, start and they said okay so the severity of this issue and the crime and the ongoing psychological impact of I think this is the most severe level of what could have happened and so the starting sentence for this I think was between six and eight years custody okay and then what they do is um they they think about well okay what are the other things we need to take into consideration here and so they state the sentence in line with the severity, and then they slowly deduct time as they take into consideration other things. So there was no reoffending. This person had pled guilty. Uh, he had been ruled by social services not to be a danger currently. He had done a lot of work in the community, all of these different things. And particularly, I was struck by the fact that the judge took into consideration the impact that his, if he went into a custodial sentence, the impact that would then have on his family and his kids who had 
not in any way being to blame for this. And what happened was uh, this gentleman ended up being um, being sentenced to custody, but um, postponed. Um, so um, he didn't actually end up going to prison. Can't remember the official word for it. Um, but we left knowing fundamentally that justice had been done. How did we know that justice had been done? I was thinking about this and I was reflecting on it. And I think I've come to three, three things that we knew that justice had been done in that moment. Number one, the reality of the evil that occurred was acknowledged. It was named without minimization, without mitigation. It was bluntly put in front of us. This is what happened. This was wrong. Number two, its impact was recognized. My friend was able to explain and to witness to the impact that injustice had had on her life. Its impact was recognized and taken into consideration. And then there was an effort shown to make things right through the form of punishment. Actions have consequences. We all know that good or bad actions have consequences. And these were shown and administered in the courtroom. And I think, challenge me on this later if you want, I think that's how justice works. There needs to be an acknowledgement of the reality of evil. We need to call it what it is without mitigation and without minimization. We need to recognize its impact on the lives of those who have been victims of it, whoever they might be. And we need to work to make it right, whether that's through earthly justice systems where this is suitable, but also as Max spoke about through trusting it to the God who knows firsthand what it's like to be on the receiving end of hideous injustice. And I believe that all three of those things, acknowledgement, recognition, and working to make it right, are present in the Christian faith, and particularly in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me briefly explain why I believe this. Again, feel free to ask me to unpack more in the Q&A. The Bible, the Christian scriptures, speak of a God who does not shy away from speaking about evil, about unjust structures and hypocrisy. Woven throughout the Christian tradition is this concept of sin, this idea of deep brokenness, of injustice rife in our world and in our lives and in our very selves. In fact, plenty of stories in the Bible, and especially you'll find them in the Old Testament narratives, they're unflinching in their descriptions of evil and of its impact. It's actually quite harrowing sometimes. If you read some of what is in there, it's the descriptions of evil and its impact shows that the Christian worldview not only acknowledges the reality of evil in the world in all its fullness, but also recognizes its impact on all those who are subject to it. Jesus himself weeps over this. Max alluded to that. And the Bible is full of details of God's anger, his righteous anger at the impact of injustice on those who are downtrodden and oppressed. God is clear in the Bible that if you are a victim of injustice, what happened to you matters. What happened to you matters. God isn't a God who glosses over injustice, like, oh, well, tough gig. What happened to you matters, matters. And the Christian faith also shows us how justice Injustice needs to be made right because injustice always has consequences. Actions have consequences. And you may well hear over the coming week about the forgiveness offered by God. And that is true and beautiful and completely there for anyone who wishes to seek it. But this does not negate the presence and reality of justice in the Christian tradition. Justice is found alongside forgiveness in the person of Christ, God himself, the Christian tradition. The Christian faith can talk about forgiveness for those who have committed even the worst possible injustices, not because repentance means there is no punishment, but because Christians believe that God himself, in the person of Jesus, took the punishment, bearing the consequences and making it right. In the Christian faith, justice is always done. Either it falls on the abuser or it falls on an all holy God who stood in their place. In the face 
of deep injustice and there is deep injustice in the world today you don't need me to tell you that just look at the headlines i believe that christianity offers true comfort and promises true fulfillment both for me as someone who has been a victim of injustice and has seen loved ones be victims of injustice but also as one who has been complicit in perpetrating injustice and perpetuating injustice in whatever form that may take. So to wrap up, fundamentally, I've given my life so far, I'm only 28, given my life so far, <laughs> to the work of justice, because I know that the world is broken. Let's not deny it. I know that the world is broken and I want to see it made right. It's a kind of human urge, right? When you see something broken. And I remain a Christian and can maintain hope whilst doing so, whilst confronted in my day job with some of the worst things that you can hear that other people do to, to one another. I can maintain hope whilst doing it because I know that it is God who is able to offer true and complete justice to those who have been wronged and true and complete mercy to those who have wronged themselves. That's it. That's it. Thank you so much, Max and Eleanor. Now we're going to have a time of uh, Q and A. So if you would like to uh, scan the uh, QR code, if you would like to uh, use the Slido, or you can ask a question uh, face and face if you like. Yes, um, Tiana, you mentioned that um, in, 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 in your job and sort of um, the things you deal with, you said that, um, Christianity helps you to maintain hope, even in the face of kind of horrible crime and so on. Does it alleviate the immediate trauma of hearing those things? Or is it always, or do you get desensitized to it? Or is it just a kind of philosophical thing? Does the actual shock trauma of hearing those things, is it alleviated by Christianity? Or That's a great question. Um, I think you have to be particularly in a role like mine, you have to be very aware of secondary trauma. Um, and that's a very real thing. Um, I think there's something about um, the, one of the things that we talk about in our work, um, we're a Christian organization. We talk a lot about how um, we need to understand the reality of what we're dealing with and throw the weight of it onto God. It's kind of like a Christian jargony way of talking. What that means is basically understanding that God um, God is ultimately responsible for it. If we believe that God is sovereign and God is all powerful, fundamentally God bears that weight. Like I ain't carrying that. If I try and bear that weight, it's going to crush me in the same way that if you try and bear the weight of injustice that has been done against you and hold resentment, it's going to crush you. Um, and so I think it doesn't in any way mitigate the immediate trauma. There have been times uh, in the office, I think even just two weeks ago, half the staff team were in tears hearing about a case that we were working on. And that's very real. And if we're not... We're not acknowledging the reality of it. We're not realizing we're not acknowledging the reality of it. Like we have to feel it. And that's actually a very human response to feel it. Um, and if we're not doing it, then something's wrong because we've become desensitized. And I don't ever want to be desensitized. Um, but I think there's something about acknowledging that we can't bear the weight of it. I'm not big enough. I'm not strong enough. And so what does it mean to, to um, put that onto God and say, actually, you know what? That's your circus and your monkeys, mate, not mine. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Feel free to come back at me if you want to. Yeah, I just wonder if um, putting the responsibility, I don't, I'm just trying to think out loud, but if you put the responsibility of it, does that not, is it not in danger of the kind of people, is it alleviating the responsibility from the perpetrators? Oh. It means that yeah. both on the receiving end and the, um, you know, the inflicting end. It's yeah. almost like we, we don't have, like, um, um, what's the word, autonomy? We kind of just, like, puppets in a way. Mm -hmm. Because it kind of works both ways, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And um, one of the things that um, my organisation seeks to do um, when it comes to victims and survivors of modern-day slavery is bring them to safety, but also hold perpetrators to account in local courts. Um, so we do seek earthly justice. And that's really significant, is that we're never going to be like, oh, well, you know, God will deal with it. Sometimes, actually, you work through the courts and you don't get a judgment that you think is the right one. Uh, and then how do you wrestle with that? How do you understand that some people commit the worst crimes imaginable and get away scot-free at that point 
uh, my understanding is that God is the judge of all. He sees all. He knows all. It says in the Bible, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord, which isn't that you kind of like, you know, have framed above your desk. But nonetheless, it's actually very important to cling to is um, even when things don't go the way that we think they do, when people who we think the evidence suggests rightly or wrongly are guilty of crimes like that. Um, how do we hold? How do we understand that? Well, we have to at some point trust that there's something bigger than us at play. Helpful. Yeah. Great. So, Brad, one question here. So, how does Christianity help with justice when the Bible commands so many unjust things? Uh, for example, archaic laws which permit slavery and the slaughter of the Canaanites. <laughs> I'll say something about the Canaanites. So this is a, uh, yeah, this is one I've wrestled with myself. Um, so yeah, it, it, in the book of Joshua in the Old Testament, it, it kind of depicts uh, Joshua leading the Israelites into uh, the land of Canaan, which had sort of been des designated as part of the promised land. And yeah, as part of that, it, it appears in the text that they, um, carry out um, you know, what, what looks like slaughter or could even be described as genocide. So um, yeah, there, there's a few things to say there. I think one is that, um, you know, uh, I, I think it, when, when we're trying to figure out what the Bible is saying, we always need to pay attention to a couple of things. So one is genre and the other is context. Um, so the genre of the book of Joshua is, is that of a sort of ancient Near Eastern conquest narrative. And so it is, it is well known that in that type of literature, the use of hyperbole is very common. So that's to say um, the use of, uh, so if, if for example, um, you know, I support uh, uh, Arsenal and I say that um, Arsenal slaughtered Manchester United, um, we wouldn't expect to go to um, Old Trafford or the Emirates Stadium and find bodies everywhere, uh, because obviously that, that, that language is being used in a hyperbolic way. And so at that, that is definitely an element that's going on there in, in the book of Joshua. So it, it is it belongs to that kind of literature where hyperbole is used. So phrases like slaughter or kill everything that breathes. Um, and, and, and it actually, you don't, we don't just need kind of, um, you know, uh, clever sort of scholars uh, in ivory towers to tell us this. The text itself, later on in the book of Joshua, has instructions for how to coexist with the Canaanites who are still living in the land after alleged, after, you know, apparently earlier they've killed everything that breathes. So that in, is an internal indicator in the text that that language of killing everything was, was hyperbole. Um, and another thing is that, um, you know, in terms of the archaeology of places like Jericho and Ai, which are some of the cities that, you know, in the narrative were subjected to these conquests, it actually looks like those were not kind of cities full of civilians, um, full of women and children and so on, but they, they were probably more like military fortresses. So, okay, that, no, that, I'm not saying that alleviates the whole problem, but that, that certainly does uh, kind of start to put things into a different perspective. Um, and I think the last thing to say is that actually the, the first people to notice that there was a problem here or that there was a tension of some kind were, were, were Christians. Um, so um, why is that significant? Well, in the, in the kind of Greco-Roman world, in, in you know, um, the, the context into which Christianity was born, I guess, um, the idea of one uh, people group or empire kind of conquering another and, and slaughtering them and enslaving them. No, like you wouldn't really have battered an eyelid. That was just what happened. Uh, that's just normal. Um, and it, it was only Christians um, in the second century onwards, reflecting on the person and teachings of Jesus, starting to say this, this kind of is uncomfortable. What's going on here? This doesn't quite seem to fit with the Jesus um, that we read about in the New Testament. And so I think, um, yeah, I, I think that, that that is just worth noting that actually it just kind of uh, goes to show how much um, mo the modern world has been saturated in Jesus' teachings. And the historian Tom Holland, who is a secular historian, writes about ancient empires, has argued in his uh, very popular book, Dominion, um, that actually our, our kind of modern sensibilities about 
um, humility, mercy, charity, um, every human being, regardless of race, gender, and so on, having equal dignity. Um, Tom Holland argues you, you just don't find these in ancient, in, in the other ancient cultures, Greece, Rome, Babylon, Persia, and so on. It really does seem to come from the teaching of Jesus. Um, and so just to finish then, I think where I land with this is that, yeah, I, I, I don't claim to have fully figured out those, those texts. I, I do think anyone who looks at them will find them uncomfortable and that there's a, a wrestle that has to happen there. But I also think that it's, it's not a kind of ad hoc move for a Christian to say that, well, actually, Jesus is the lens through which we, we read the entire Bible. Um, and so, it, you know, it's not as though these it's not as though that's where the story ends with with these slightly troubling passages that involve a lot of violence. If that's all we had, um, I think, yeah, we, we would have a problem. But actually, we um, we have Jesus, who is the lens through which we interpret all of this. Um, yeah. I, um, and th there was another aspect of the question. I think. It was um, permit slavery as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hello. Um, <laughs> I think, again, this is something which I um, regularly ponder. Um, again, I would draw in some of what um, Max talked about around the different context. Um, so when we think slavery, our minds will go to like transatlantic slave trade or bonded labour slavery. Um, what perhaps we just need to recalibrate around is that slavery was, um, wasn't in terms of often forced um, it was a form of employment. It involved kind of um, houses and um, basically looking after your family. Um, so that's just worth thinking about. Also, every um, every seven years written into the um, New Testament law is that every seven years, uh, any land that you would um, you had you'd have to sell or if, you had to, if you'd run out of land to sell to support your family, you sold yourself into slavery. You, everything was returned to you every seven years. And so there is part of a kind of cycle of um, redemption isn't quite the right word, but I can't think of what word I want. Um, there's a kind of cycle of being returned to um, what the correct order. And so slavery um, wasn't you're being trapped under threat of or actual violence, which is kind of the issue with the modern day slavery. Instead, it was an economic choice um, in order often made to um, look after a family um, or um, similar, but feel free to push back on that. I'm not hot on all those details, but I'll give them a best shot. But wouldn't that still be like kind of unjust? Just because of your like lower economic status or like socioeconomic status, you have to like you don't have other choices. You have to like become a slave of someone else, like just working for them, and like it permits such doing, which means that it kind of supports such like. Like I would see as injustice. It depends. Yes. Um. I guess it depends how you view it. If you view um the modern workplace as a form of injustice, because we have to earn ways of engaging and getting money and all of that kind of thing. That is, is this whole kind of system, isn't it? Um. Happy to to discuss further. I think I think it's a complicated um complicated issue also again would draw on some of what max said about the new testament and jesus and the way that he um his teaching is a lot about there are actually no such thing as slave or free um jews or gentiles male or female all are one in christ jesus and that kind of radical realigning of um those um those ideals and those social structures of actually we are all one in christ jesus we're all equal um and even in at the end of the new testament the book of something called philemon um, Paul, the apostle, is writing about a slave who has um, who has escaped. Uh, and traditionally, if a slave escaped uh, in Greco-Roman culture, they would, if they came back, they would be killed. Like, oh, you, sorry, bad luck. Um, but um, in this um, in this book, Paul is writing to say, actually, I'm sending Philemon back to you. Would you welcome him back as a brother in Christ? And because of that, um, that kind of radical realigning um, and restatusing of people in the New Testament, we see a, a kind of a bit of a subversive um, idea of that. Sorry? I have a question about, like, I guess, as, as how do Christians keep their actions towards doing justice 
from being just virtue signaling in the context of marriage. Like, if God is the ultimate judge, um, like, why should we, like, sort of, well, what, what is the sort of benefit of seeking justice in, in our world and our, with our own means? Yeah. Um, well, um, so I think virtue signaling is obviously it's an accusation that you know, gets thrown around a lot in social media now. And I, I think the idea is supposed to be that there's something bad about um, kind of championing a cause when it doesn't really cost you anything, but it makes you look good to champion that cause. And um, I suppose like I, I do, I think that, that Jesus has a lot to say to this kind of phenomenon. And now, now I should say as well, I, I do think sometimes the accusation of virtue signaling is unhelpful and it can be a way of just trying to create a smoke screen because at the end of the day, you, you might think like, well, it's better that someone pursues justice out of slightly impure motives than that they just don't care at all, right? So just putting that aside though, I do think Jesus has a lot to say to this. Um, he talks a lot about outward displays of piety and how kind of worthless those are when they are coming from a heart that is primarily concerned with looking good in front of other people. And so I, I actually think Christianity has more resources to help us to, to kind of think about why pursuing justice for its own sake is 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 more important than sort of how it looks because at the end of the day if christianity is true there's a god who sees our genuine motives kind of sees right into the heart um and so so yeah i, I think that that that's why you know virtue the bad kind of virtue signaling where, where it really is just because i want to look a certain way i think that that's you know i i think uh, yeah as jesus says that the reason that's not good is because um, it's actually I'm actually doing something bad to myself I'm kind of creating a split between who I am inside and the person I'm trying to portray to the world and that that's that's bad actually for me um, and so yeah I, I I think that that it get, Christianity gives us a picture on which we can make sense of why there needs to be this integration between the things I do outwardly and who I am in that sense I, I, I guess uh, one question I had was um, to return to this kind of idea of why we seek justice. So, like, I, I think most people will agree that seeking justice is important. And both of you have said in various ways through your answers that because we kind of, we instinctively know something is evil and that, you know, we, we revolt against this, that's that's been given as kind of implied, implied, implicitly given as a reason why we seek justice. But um, I guess my question would be, so why do you think people, is, is there a reason besides from that? Or, or is it like, is it just something like instinctual, you think, why we seek justice? I don't know, this is a question to both. So yeah. you, you can take some time, sorry. Um. I think there is a an instinctive knowledge um, of some, when something is right or wrong. Um, there's a great um, quotation from uh, C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, where he says, one of my um, issues with the existence of God was um, how could there be a God in this world was so evil and broken. But um, actually, how then I came to realize, how do I know what evil and broken is? Because if the line is crooked, I have to know what a straight line looks like. And I think um, there is an absolute, some things that are absolutely good. And um, there is a kind of, there's a straight line to which we can compare the things that are um, right or wrong. Um, so is it instinctive? I think there is a part of it. I think there's also a degree of empathy involved. Um, like I can think if something like this happened to me, um, I would want to see justice. I would want to see something um, rectified. I would like to see an acknowledgement of what it's, um, what it is, a uh, kind of a reasonable acknowledgement of the impact, um, and then I'd like to see it worked out. Um, and so the level of empathy that different uh, people are able to engage with 
um, varies massively and can depend on the different situations which we're confronted with. There are some things I can't imagine ever happening to me. I just can't get into that headspace, but there are other things that make me feel like I've been punched in the gut. Um, and so I think there is a level of instinct if I know this is right or wrong, or I know this is wrong. And if I know this is wrong, then how I, if, if this were done to me, I would want something to change. Does that yeah. answer your question? Yeah, great. Crystal? I wanted to ask one of the questions that's really popular which is, um, is it justice if a murder or rapist becomes a Christian and goes to heaven, but like a victim is an atheist and goes to hell? And kind of similarly, like, how can Christianity be just if people who don't believe in God go to hell? Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll start <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, I think we probably need to approach this by thinking about what hell is according to the bible um and so i think if we have this image of hell as this place where um people who didn't get the right information are kind of tortured forever i think that and and and, and to be fair a lot of medieval art basically did portray it in that way a sort of dante's inferno um it, it's understandable why there is this cultural perception that that's what Christianity teaches. Um, but actually, I think, um, so, so the best explanation or one of the most helpful explanations I've come across of, in terms of the justice of hell and actually why, why, it, why it does make sense um, that there should be such a thing is uh, from the, the author C.S. Lewis. Who um, so basically he he has a, a novel called The Great Divorce, which um, is a is a kind of thought experiment in a way, but it depicts a group of of inhabitants of hell taking a kind of bus trip for a day to heaven, and each of these people who come up from hell um, is met by a friend or relative from their earthly life, um, and and basically it's a series of sort of vignettes focusing on each of these different characters in turn as um, their, their loved one tries to persuade them to kind of to, to cross the threshold. And basically what's really interesting is, and now, now you might think on the surface uh, at face value, well, of course, what, why, would, why would anyone turn that down if, if they actually knew what was being offered? But, but I think what Lewis does a really skillful job of showing is that, so in each of these cases, there's something that prevents a person from being willing to submit to the idea that that they would be under the, the um, under the kind of rule of un, uh, under the reign of God, um, and so you know whether it's because what this this person who is a sort of theologian in his lifetime is is adamant that 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 he he has to be able to still kind of um, you know uh, have this this attitude of of sort of inquiry and and skepticism that he's so valued in his life and he doesn't want to have to see God in, in this really obvious way or whether it's someone else who um interesting with the case of the murder um there's this character who um the person who meets him actually did commit a murder who was his friend in his lifetime and but the person who uh, has come up from hell um at the end of the day can't stomach the idea that before God, everyone has to be humbled and, and no, no one can really sort of hold it over another person that I, I was sort of better than you in this lifetime. And that, that um, the idea that, that we would have to accept kind of reality on God's terms is something that this person just, just, just doesn't want at the end of the day. And so um, the way Lewis depicts hell, in short, is as a place where people are granted their self-willed choice to not have to live in a reality that is on God's terms, basically. Um, it's a, um, and, and so in that sense, I think as um, Lewis put it, you know, there are two types of people at the end of the day, those to whom, uh, those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says thy will be done. So um, it's, it's basically, the idea then that God is, uh, hell is a place in which God respects um, the, the free choice of his creatures. And I, 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 the only alternative I can think of to that um, is one in which basically God compels those who don't want to live on those terms to be with him. 
And you could argue that actually hell would, uh, heaven would be hell to someone who didn't want to exist on those terms. Um, so I, I hope that starts to address the question. Yeah, I just had a quick follow-up on that as well as to segue from that. Um, I have a very uh, clever family member who's <clears throat> also a Christian, but he, he has um, a way of um, talking about the Gospels in terms of the Gospel means good news. Mm -hmm. And um, his, his idea when he talks to me is that, you know, if, if the Gospel is truly good news, then how can we turn down people and how can we say um, that there's going to be a heaven or a hell? Have we got to rethink or are we looking at that's it the wrong the, a different way do we have to look at it like a with, with a new with a fresh perspective um yeah i mean like i said I, I don't think the right way to come at it is in terms of people being tortured against their will for, for sort of have the ticking the, the wrong you know for not reading the small print carefully enough that yeah. that's not the right way to think about it, it it's ultimately a person's choice to to accept God's offer of relationship or not. Thank you. Um, uh, and I know we have a question for you. So um, has any of the injustice you've seen while working for an NGO challenged your faith? And how did you deal with this? Uh, most days. Um, <laughs> yes, um, because the reality of, of evil is horrendous. Um, and I, there's a lot of things that I really, I really struggle with. I mean, to kind of um, build off the back of um, the question prior around the issue of kind of um, judgment and grace and heaven and hell, like I personally fundamentally believe that anyone who repents and turns to Jesus will, um, will be forgiven and will go home justified. I find that really hard to swallow a lot of the time. I'm just going to be really honest with you. I find that really difficult when you think about some of the realities of what goes on. But I also know that that is fundamentally good news and that's, that makes sense to me somehow in a way that I can't really explain off the cuff. I have to write it down. Um, and I think, yes, it frequently challenges my faith, but it also deepens it because even in the midst of, of darkness and depravity, there is such hope and there is such change and things are, are shifting um, in ways which are frankly, like I would use the word miraculous, like they don't really make any sense. Like the, the organization that I've worked for has seen slavery reduced by up to 86% in the places that they've worked. Like the, the industry standard for that would be like 20 to 25 percent that's what was expected and they saw up to 86 percent and so in the midst of in the midst of deep darkness and hopelessness and oh my goodness I can't believe this is happening there is also light and hope and oh my goodness I can't believe this is happening um and somehow we have to learn to live in that tension um, which we all have to learn to live out tension on a big scale or a little scale of the world is so broken and yet there's still goodness. And how do we understand this? How do I hold this? How do I dance in this gray area that isn't black and isn't white and doesn't really make any sense? And fundamentally to me that the Christian faith and um, the Christian worldview makes the most sense of the world in which I've been confronted. And that's why I remain a Christian. There's a interesting question here. So, if Christianity is a justice tradition, why hasn't it produced more moral people? It's not like Christians have all the moral people out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, that's fair. Uh, absolutely. I mean, um, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, if you've followed what's been going on in, a, in you know, particularly North America in the last few years, there have been a number of really high profile scandals involving Christian leaders. And um, I think, and, and many people have their faith kind of really challenged by that, um, me included, because, you know, on the one hand, um, you have um, these people who are really looked up to as, as kind of exemplars and role models of Christian faith who are sometimes doing appalling things behind closed doors. Um, so how do we make sense of that? I think 
I mean, I think what one thing is that, I, and I, I think this one, one has to be careful how far this is pushed, but you know, Jesus talks about the fact that, you know, there will be people who, you know, call him Lord, Lord, and so on, and, and who are and not, who, who actually do not know him. So I, I think we have to reckon with the fact that not everyone who calls themselves a follower of Jesus really is. I also think we have to be careful to, you know, the, the, the no true Scotsman thing of saying, oh, anyone who, who misbehaves therefore must not really have been a Christian. And actually, unfortunately, it's more messy than that. But I think the thing I would come back to is that um, it's so a friend of mine did a, um, a kind of uh, interfaith dialogue on, on religious violence. And, and there were representatives of various religious traditions there. But and something that was pointed out to him by, I think, the representatives from Islam and Judaism was that, well, you have Jesus who pretty much every, you know, even even kind of um, avowed secularists like Jesus and think that he was a good guy. Um, and so the reason, in one sense, it's harder for Christianity because, um, you know, that there's that sense of really, you know, outrageous hypocrisy when a Christian leader um, is abusing women, for example. But on the other hand, the reason that the, 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 the accusation is so pointed in the first place is because I think people are sensing that gap between the Christian who... Um, who is doing this appalling stuff and the Jesus who they claim to follow. I think people are, are sensing that it's actually because Jesus is so clearly a kind of embodiment of, of goodness and of, of the, the well-lived human life that, that we're sensing that. Um, can I, my, um, I have a bit of a personal reflection on this one. Um, when I was kind of a teenager, um, my parents, both clergy, um, but um, because of something that another Christian did, my family, we lost our home, they lost their jobs, we had to leave the city that we'd lived in for nine years because of another Christian. And I was like, uh, excuse me, <laughs> what? And um, was very angry and was like, this doesn't make any sense. Why is this person who claims to follow this God doing this to my family and to those whom I love? Um, and I spent a long time being really, really mad about it and really, really mad at God. Um, let me just shift slightly. I met my husband on an online dating website, okay? This is going to make sense. Don't panic. Just keep your attention. I met my husband on an online dating website, okay? It would make literally no sense if I met him, looked at his profile online, and then went and talked to all his friends about him and said, hey, tell me about Marcus. Tell me about Marcus. What's he like? What's he like? Tell me about some experience you've had with him. What I should do is I should go on a date with the, with the boy, right? Should I actually go on a date with him? Should I actually get to know him as he presents himself? It would make literally no sense for me to marry a guy in this um, who I just met his friends, right? And so I apply that. I applied that kind of logic to God, and I went to the Gospels, and I went to who God said he was, right? Because there's no point in me going and asking a whole bunch of Christians, as useful as it is, and I don't do down this event, I'm here. But there is no point in asking a whole bunch of Christians, what do you think of God if you're not going to go to the source? And so if you're genuinely curious about how, um, how can Christians do this or why, who is this Jesus who they're claiming to follow and actually their, their actions don't always line up, I'd say go to the source. Like don't date a guy and ask all his friends about him. Date a guy and go on a date with him. I'm not saying you date Jesus, but you know what I mean, <laughs> right? You go to the source. And so if you're curious and you don't understand, once I went to the Gospels, once I read the Bible, I couldn't look away. I was utterly convicted by the kindness of Jesus. And that's why I'm still here. It's because no matter how many times I may end up losing my home because of another Christian, um, Jesus is kind. And I can't unsee that. I just can't. And so if you're curious and you've been asking loads of questions, I'd invite you to go to the source. Well, thank you very much. I think that concludes our event and um, just a round of applause for our now we have a time of reflection. So there'll be some pens coming around uh, for you to uh, sign these uh, so you my cards, contact cards. Um, yeah, and um, I'm sure um, Max and um, Anna would be lovely to um, 
Um, if you have any further questions as well, obviously. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. It's really, really important because, like, we need to vote if you found the host complete forever. Um, just some words, like, any words to write down on this ad about, like, I found the chair. Yeah, I'm not necessarily. Just like, off route. That's good. And Everyone, I'm just going to plug tomorrow's event because we have um, like a mid midday um, midday event tomorrow. Um, just load up my phone. Free pizza. There will be free pizza. That was what that was. About. Yes. So get excited. Yay. Yay. Uh, on success. Tomorrow's tomorrow's topic is on success and is at twelve thirty uh, at CBG. Uh, the second. Who is it? Um, Jeremy Anderson. What did he do? Uh, it's all executive board member of PBS. <laughs> so you, everyone's, everyone's welcome to come. See you boys. Pizza and we have we have to get these new like grabby hands and I don't know if it's going to be like no one else I don't think they do but yeah I'm posting one of them last week now I'm going to be doing what I said to them yeah I'm glad that you yes <laughs> 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 Yeah, that was a lot of fun. It's really fascinating to me, I think, because I don't like my career. Yeah, yeah, yeah.